This story happened in the village where I used to live many years ago. It was a poor village. The story was passed down orally a long time later, and I also heard it from my father. It was an overcast day. A couple was living in the village looking for their child. Both of them had been busy since morning to go to work, so they didn't have time to take care of the baby. The boy always played in front of the yard, but they still hadn't seen him until dinner time that day. They began searching everywhere from afternoon until late at night because they were worried about their children having bad things. The couple went to every house in the village to ask around. Even the neighbors who had a bad relationship with them, the couple asked, not leaving anyone out. But none of them had seen the boy. At this time, the sky was dark and the hearts of the couple were insecure. Their faces showed concern that their child was maybe in danger. They had lived here for a long time and they believed that their child couldn't be kidnapped. The couple did not have time to think because there was not too much time left. The couple continued the search. In the village they had found most of them so they decided to go to the edge of the forest to have a look. As soon past a house at the end of the village the couple saw the elder man living there. He was disabled in both legs and was in a wheelchair. As soon as the older man saw the couple, he called them over and asked if they were looking for their son. It seemed he had seen the couple's son. As soon as hearing the news about their son, the couple was so overjoyed that they stopped and asked the older man more carefully. But contrary to their joy, what the older man said worried them even more. According to the older man's account, it seemed that the son was led by something. After hearing this, the couple became extremely afraid and their faces gradually turned green. Seeing the couple's panicked expressions, the older man also quickly recounted what he saw. Today, when it was just getting dark, the older man's gambling addict son pushed them to the front porch to enjoy the breeze and then left to play cards. But until evening, his son did not return. So the older man continued to wait on the porch. The village road at this time was also gradually quiet and no longer a shadow of anyone. Suddenly, in that silent space, heavy footsteps sounded from nowhere. Because the road was very deserted and relatively narrow, the footsteps could be heard clearly, which caught the older man's attention. He quickly glanced in the direction of the sound when the shadow of a child appeared faintly in the mist. For some reason, the fog was so thick, it was more like they were surrounding the boy. Because it was dark, the older man couldn't see the child's face. But looking at his appearance and clothes, the older man knew that the child was a couple's son at the top of the village because the child often ran around the village to play. The older man asked, but the boy did not respond, continuing to walk slowly and heavily. The boy didn't look the same as usual. As a person who had lived for many years and had a lot of experience, the older man knew for sure that something was following him. The older man looked down at the boy's feet under the fog. His guess was not wrong. The boy walked, but his feet did not touch the ground. It looked like he was walking on the tip of his toes, looking very strange. But the older man remained calm and called the boy over to talk. After several times of trying to call out to the boy, the boy turned, looked at the older man with a scary look on his face. But that scared the older man even more because he knew the boy was no longer aware. The boy's eyes were wide, white and his face was devoid of any emotion. He stared at the older man, his eyes growing larger and full of veins, his pupils almost disappearing and his face pale. The older man understood that the boy was no longer a normal human being. Some force was controlling the boy. The older man tried to talk and ask questions to wake the boy, but to no avail. The boy still didn't care and kept walking. The older man felt so dangerous when he saw the boy slowly walk away from the village towards the forest. In the middle of the night, the older man tried his best to call to the boy but couldn't. 
When the boy was almost out of the village, the older man saw that there was a figure following behind the boy. It was a man. But the terrible thing was that his clothes were rotten, he was barefoot, and one arm was bare with only a white skeleton. After hearing the older man kept calling the boy back, the strange man turned and looked directly at the older man. At this point the older man began to panic because of the strange man's sore face. The pupil of his eye had fallen out and was hanging from his face. His teeth were sharp like a wild animal. It was clear that he was not human. Seeing that the older man was about to call to the boy, he suddenly became angry and turned towards the older man. When he turned around, the older man could see his ulcerated body and only his white bones. It scared the older man so much he almost fell. But after scaring the older man into silence, the strange man continued to walk behind the boy's back and left the village. The older man couldn't walk so he tried to shout for help, but no one heard. So he sat and waited for someone to pass by the house and he finally met the couple. After hearing the story, the couple panicked because they couldn't believe their ears. However, the older man insisted that he was not mistaken or lying. The older man asked the couple to go to the forest to find their son. After hearing that, the husband asked the wife to go home to find a lamp to prepare to go to the forest to search. And he quickly ran to call more people to help. After that, the people in the village also gathered to help the couple find their child. They split into groups and rummaged through the forest. But the couple did not rest, but searched all night but the result was still empty, without a trace of the sun. The wife was very heartbroken. The couple could only hug each other and cry, but could not do anything more. They continued to search for another day, but still could not find anything. The next night, because of anxiety, the wife could not sleep. She cried all night because she was worried about her son. She then fell asleep without knowing it. In a reverie, she faintly heard a familiar voice. The voice was getting louder and clearer. It was the son's voice. She suddenly opened her eyes and woke up to see her son standing next to the bed, pale skin and a cold mouth. Seeing her child, she was overjoyed and burst into tears, quickly asking if her son was okay. The boy did not answer but turned his back to the door, still whimpering that he was so cold. Seeing that, the wife also rushed out of bed to run after her child. But the boy went very fast, still unable to keep up. The son was walking faster and faster, so fast that the wife had to run after him, but it was still too late. The shadow of the child was getting farther and farther away. After chasing forever, the son led her to an old well. No matter how much his mother cried, the boy didn't care. He headed straight for the well and plunged down. The wife screamed in panic, but her body for some reason became extremely slow, unable to do anything. But the time she got there, her son had jumped into the well. She cried and called the son's name, but below was a deep and dark pit. Then the wife suddenly woke up. It was all just a nightmare. Seeing his wife screaming, the husband woke up and asked her what was going on only to find his wife crying and sobbing. At this time, the wife also understood that her son was no longer alive. That dream was a foreshadowing. She told her husband the two people were heartbroken. No one said anything else. Then they calmed down and started taking hammers. They headed towards the deserted well. It was an old family well that had been sealed since their parents were alive. No one knew where the key was. But when they saw their child in the dream, they broke the lock and went to the well to check. Above the well's mouth, there was a large and heavy rock, which the sun could not lift. In their hearts, they wished it was all just a nightmare. The husband began to bring down the rock that covered the mouth of the well. Both of them looked down at the bottom of the well to check, but all was not as they expected. At the bottom, Indeed, was the body 
of the family's young son. Even though the couple was born in a dream and mentally prepared, they still could not accept this cruel truth. They didn't understand how the boy was able to go through the locked door, lift the big rock and jump into the well like that. After that, people also helped them to bring up the body of their son. This story had been passed around a lot in my hometown, but there was no reasonable answer about the son's death. Recently, a small supermarket was built in my neighborhood and it is also the first supermarket built in this area, so people here are very curious and frequently visited it. Inside, it's similar to many other supermarkets. However, after only a few days of operation, the supermarket's customer base gradually decreased from a crowded supermarket to an empty one. Every morning the toys in the children's stall were discovered lying on the ground, strewn about. This infuriated the investor, a wealthy woman. She has repeatedly admonished the staff, but the same thing keeps happening. Her eyes raged at the supermarket manager, blaming him for not managing his employees well and blaming the employees for being lazy and refusing to clean. The manager was also taken aback when he heard this. He tried to explain the toys issued to the investor and explained that he tried himself, but he couldn't fix it. When the investor heard that, she assumed that someone had broken into the supermarket late at night and attempted to ask the manager to find a solution. Initially the manager was also perplexed and disturbed. He stated that he checked the camera at the supermarket every night but had yet to see anyone because these toys had been used continuously since the supermarket opened so his words to the investors served were like an excuse to avoid responsibility. There was no other option. The investor threatened to fire the manager if he allowed the situation to continue without investigating the cause. Seeing this, the manager promised the investor that he would instruct security guards at the children's stall every night to investigate who had tampered with the goods in this location. He finally persuaded the investor after a while. So tonight was the first night that security guards would be on duty at the supermarket. The later the atmosphere in this place became cold and gloomy when the entire area inside the supermarket sank into a strange silence. When the supermarket closed, they began to turn off the lights. There wasn't a single person in the supermarket aisle. Two security guards were stationed here overnight. They had to check around the supermarket and then sleep in the children's stall area according to the manager's orders. They both went to the toy section to look around. Inside all of the new and used items had been cleaned and neatly arranged on the shelves. One guard prepared a place to sleep while the other used the time to look around before taking a nap. They would spend the night in the warehouse, which was located opposite the children's stall, to facilitate inspection and to catch red-handed the vandal. After a long period of no unusual movement, one of them became tired and felt sleepy. They both spread blankets and pillows on the floor and placed them next to each other their attitudes were unconcerned. Before going to sleep, a middle-aged security guard made a joke that when there were both of them sleeping there tonight, nothing would happen. When the other person heard this, he felt relieved and fell asleep. The current atmosphere in the supermarket fell into silence once again. In the middle of the night, when it looked like nothing would happen, a ghostly phenomenon appeared. The sound of children singing resounded in the supermarket's quiet space. 
The black shadow is clearly imprinted on the curtain in the darkness of the night when the two guards were sleeping for a while. They were infants who had just started walking. They walked in a long line, babbling children's rhymes as they made their way to the toy store. The singing startled the guard, who opened his eyes and looked behind the curtain. When he saw the black figures approaching, he turned to wake up the other guard sleeping next to him, telling him that the bad guys had arrived. The two quickly grabbed the flashlight that had been left nearby and went to the children's store hoping to arrest the vandals that had been hidden for so long. For fear of making a sound and causing the culprit to flee, the two crept up, walked over to the thin curtain nestled behind it and slowly lifted the curtain to observe. Children in swelled clothes appeared in front of them. They were mischievous, competing to remove the toys from the shelf and play together. The children were unaware that two guards were watching them from behind so they were free to play as usual. Their eyes glowed so strangely and monstrously. A guard noticed the scene and thought it was bizarre, not knowing where these children had come from, so he planned to run over them. But as he took a step forward, the children's faces appeared in the dark with strange horror expressions, as if they were ghosts. The guard covered his mouth because he was shocked and he didn't know what to do because he knew these kids were not human. However, the guard in the back was terrified and couldn't help but scream out loud. The children's attention were immediately drawn towards the scream. They were startled, stopped their games and turned to stare at the two guards with black, lifeless eyes. Both guards were impatient enough to hide and watched them at this point. Their faces turned purple from fear and they could only scream and tremble. When the children realized they were being watched by humans, their expressions changed immediately, becoming angry and revealing devil's faces. But they also knew there was nothing they could do about it, so they disintegrated into grey smoke and vanished. The toys in their hands also fell to the ground one after the other, resounding with frightening knocks. The two guards realized they had just met baby ghosts, but had no choice but to sit close together, shivering and muttering mantras to protect themselves. Wait until dawn and then move on. The next morning, the two security guards told the strange story they had encountered to the supermarket's manager and investor. It made everyone concerned. The owner of the supermarket seemed to know something ahead of time. She immediately invited a shaman to perform an exorcism and prayed for the dead babies in this location. After that night, the supermarket also blocked the children's stall. A red ribbon was stretched across the front of the stall and no one was permitted to enter. The investor sighed and recalled when she was asked about what caused the supermarket to be haunted by the dead. She claimed that the supermarket used to be a private maternity hospital of a doctor. Everyone in my neighborhood was familiar with this hospital. This location was well known for abortions. The fetuses would be cremated after abortion in the hospital's secret morgue, which was now a children's stall. No one dared to approach it for a long time because it was full of evil spirits. The employees who worked here later died for various reasons. As a result, the hospital was demolished and sold to the owner of the supermarket, but the dead remained. Jin was a horror novel author. That day, she invited Jack, her new close friend, to drink milk tea to listen to him tell weird stories. Jack's village was inherently a secluded place and famous for its spiritual stories. Jack very happily began to tell his story because he had a big cup of milk tea. Let's talk about Jack's village first. It was a small remote village located in the northeast. This place was where Jack used to live all his childhood. The story began with a small quarrel between two women, Hanjin and Pin Lu. The girl with short hair, 
a fierce face was Pen Lu. She believed that Han Jin deliberately seduced many men in the area while her husband was away on business. But Han Jin denied it. She said that Pen Lu was deliberately playing bad things to dishonor her. The more she argued, the more furious Pen Lu began to use offensive words against Han Jin. Seeing that, Han Jin's family also advised her to go back not to pay attention to Pen Lu's words because arguing in the street only made them embarrassed. Hearing the advice of her family, Han Jin quickly returned home. But before leaving, Han Jin cursed that Pen Lu would have to rot her face and die. However, Pen Lu did not care about that. For some reason, Pen Lu slept very soundly that night and didn't wake up until noon the next day. She also wondered why her husband did not wake her up. Everything in the house was quiet. She walked out the door and didn't see any movement. Very confused, so she decided to open the door and go out to see how it was outside. As soon as she opened the door, a certain liquid stirred from above, causing her to panic. Pin Lu immediately had to scream out of panic. A dead chicken, its head severed and blood pouring from it was hanging in front of Pin Lu's house. The chicken's head lying in the middle of the blood pool was placed in the middle of the door. The scene was so scary. However, after regaining her composure, Pin Lu who had a hot temper immediately thought that it was because Han Jin was playing tricks. So she started to stand in front of the house and held. But as soon as she spoke, her husband ran up to her from the beginning and stopped her. He told her to be quiet and go into the house. Pin Lu, of course, refused. She insisted on going to Han Jin's house to ask for clarification. At this time, seeing that his wife could not be stopped, the husband informed her with bad news. Last night, Han Jin had taken poison to commit suicide because her husband's family suspected her because of Pen Lu's words. They thought if Han Jin didn't do anything wrong, why would others say that? The husband also said that after Han Jin's death, her family thought that Pen Lu made up the story, so she was humiliated and killed herself like that. This caused trouble for Pen Lu's family. Her husband wanted Pen Lu to stay at home for a while and didn't let them see or something would happen. The matter was so serious but Pin Lu still had a bad mouth and doubted Han Jin's death. She assumed that Han Jin was making excuses to make things go smoothly and if Han Jin was really dead, it had nothing to do with her. The husband also had no way with his wife, urging her to go back inside to smooth things out. If Han Jin's family saw her, they'd probably beat her to death. But in the middle of the night, when her husband was fast asleep, Pin Lu sneaked out. She wanted to see with her own eyes that Han Jin was dead. She went to Han Jin's front door and saw her family members wearing mourning and standing at the door, still not satisfied. She turned around to the back of the house and saw a large rock placed next to the wall as if calling her to climb. Without hesitation, she climbed up to look inside. After struggling for a long time, she managed to climb to the top. But it was not known whether by coincidence or instigation. But the place she climbed up at the same time was the place where Hanjin's coffin and body were located. Due to suicide by drinking pesticides, Hanjin's face turned black like smoke, looking very unsightly. Hanjin's body, lying still in the coffin, suddenly moved, her eyes wide and bloodshot, looking at Pin Lu with hatred. Scared, Pin Lu panicked and fell backward, falling off the big rock. She didn't know where her face had hit, but there was a long cut on her cheek that looked like it was painful. But she didn't have time to care about that. She was scared, so she quickly returned to her home. Even in the days that followed, she could not sleep well. Nightmares kept coming to torment her. She always felt Hanjin's eyes staring at her. That 
Magneda start to awake and scream in panic, causing her husband to panic and wake up as well. She was sweating profusely now and her face was full of fear. The wound on her face began to bleed again, drenching her entire face. That made the husband extremely worried because at first the wound was just a shallow wound which stopped the bleeding and healed. He didn't understand why now it was cracked and seemed heavier. But because she thought it was just a small wound, Pinlu also bandaged it up and resumed normal activities. But it was not over yet. In the days that followed, even during the day, Pinlu had to live in fear because she always felt that Hanjin was watching her from afar. Hanjin's figure kept appearing before her eyes. Sometimes Hanjin hovered and looked at her over the fence wall with an angry expression as if she wanted to eat Pin Lu alive. Panicked, Pin Lu threw away the bundle of clothes she was crocheting and ran into the house to hide. That night, Pin Lu could not sleep, tossing and turning because of fear. She glanced around to see if Hanjin would appear again. But the strange thing was that the wound on her face became more and more itchy and uncomfortable. She unconsciously scratched the wound with her hand, causing her wound to bleed again, drenching the bandage and soaking it all out. The husband heard his wife's cry and woke up, asking Pin Lu what had happened. She cried and panicked and told her husband that her wound was suddenly so itchy that she couldn't stand it anymore. Seeing that his wife was uncomfortable, the husband also helped her remove the bandage to see the wound inside. But as soon as he saw it, her husband panicked. Pin Lu's face was disfigured. The wound from the beginning had now begun to seriously ulcerate and rot. Every patch of skin on her cheek was rotting to the point of falling apart. The flesh inside could be seen and even emitting a very foul stench. From that day on, she started going crazy, always saying she saw Hanjin looking at her or attacking her, to the point that her family had to lock her in a warehouse because when she went crazy, she would run around screaming and attack others. She also repeatedly knelt begging Hanjin to spare her life, even though in front of her was devoid of any figure. Everyone assumed that she was crazy, so she was paranoid. One day, her husband brought rice as usual when he found out that she had committed suicide by drinking pesticide. Even her husband didn't know where she ended up getting the potion, but he was sure it was Hanjin's doing. Because before Pin Lu died, the husband saw Hanjin, but at that time he thought it was because he was dizzy. That night, the husband was sitting in the house because he was sad so he drank alone. He then heard his wife's screams coming from the warehouse. Looking in that direction, only a few meters away from the room, he caught a glimpse of a woman's silhouette hovering outside the warehouse window. Wanting to see better, he stood up and opened the window when the figure was gone. At that time, he thought it was because he was looking at it wrong. Jack drank milk tea while telling the story excitedly. Jin also felt that the story was scary. It was right not to offend anyone or there would be unexpected consequences. Jack said he still had a lot of good stories, so he would slowly tell Jin later. The incident occurred to a couple in my village. My village was a place that specialized in supplying medicinal herbs to the big city at the time and the family was one of the households that specialized in growing valuable medicinal plants. The business was going well, but every month the husband needed to go to the big city to collect money and before he left, the wife always went to the front door to see him off and instructed him on various matters. He was a man after all, 
It made the wife afraid that her husband would go to the city and get involved in bad things, but her husband consoled her and promised to return soon. So the wife just stood there holding her child and watching her husband leave for work. Three days later the husband returned from work unannounced, which surprised the wife. Business was good this month, they made a lot of money, so the husband bought his wife a bottle of high-end perfume. Despite the fact that she said it was expensive, the wife was overjoyed because her husband had always loved her unconditionally. When they got a large sum of money, he always bought gifts for her. A married couple's life had always been extremely happy for them so far. Because the husband had worked non-stop for three days and had driven a long distance to return, he was exhausted that night. So after dinner, his family turned off the lights and went to bed early. The wife was sleeping soundly when she heard something very annoying. It sounded like someone scratching and it jolted her awake. When she turned to look at her husband, she noticed he was scratching furiously at his arm, scratching so hard that he almost tore his shirt, causing the wife to panic. She stopped him and called him to wake up. He said he felt itchy on his arm and couldn't help scratching it. The wife reasoned that it was itching because her husband was away from work and hadn't taken good good bath, so she pulled out her husband's shirt to examine it. The wife exclaimed in surprise as soon as he pulled down his sleeve. The husband's itching wasn't due to a lack of hygiene. It was where his arm had developed a large number of red spots similar to a blister but much more swollen and itchy, causing both of them to become worried. The husband went to the clinic near the house early the next morning to see what was wrong with him. Even the doctor was surprised when he saw it, because blisters had quickly grown larger and spread to almost the entire length of his right arm. Today they had swollen enormously. The doctor just touched it. It burst open and the inside was completely filled with thick pus. The doctor suspected an infectious disease. The couple had a big argument because of that doctor's diagnosis. The wife thought he met some girls or did dirty things to get such a serious infection which made him very angry. But the husband flatly denied it, insisting that he had done nothing wrong behind his wife's back and that he had no idea why he was so sick. The wife continued to cry and blame so the husband became very upset and went out leaving his wife in the room, then going to a pub near his house alone, his arm still crazy itchy. He drank a lot of alcohol, partly because he was upset that his wife doubted him, and partly because he was sick with a strange disease. So the more he drank, the more he forgot the sadness. He drank from the bottle to bottle for an unknown amount of time. He didn't get up and leave until the pub closed. His gait was no longer stable at this point. Because he was completely out of his mind, the husband went home unconsciously. He slipped and fell into the dry rice fields below while walking on the dark dirt road. The road was not too high from the rice field, but he was unlucky enough to fall and break his leg. So he had to stay at home with his broken leg and now the pustules had spread to almost his entire body. The broken leg was also very painful and he couldn't move at all allowed the itching and pain to rage freely. Because the wife was angry and suspected that he was having an affair, she did not take good care of him, so the wounds caused by the pustules were not cleaned and smelled worse by the day. The wife went to her mother's house one day and told her mother her story. She didn't forget to blame her husband because the doctor had also said that this disease couldn't be cured and she was at a loss for what to do. Her mother on the other hand believed that because the husband had always been a kind and loving person, he couldn't be the type to interact with other women. On the contrary, being that sick in such a short period of time looked like to be bad luck or a curse. Hearing this, the wife began to reconsider everything, but she had no idea who she could turn to for help for her husband. Seeing this, her mother suggested a famous shaman in the next village who might be able to help her. The wife left early the next day to invite the shaman to her home and check on her husband's situation. The old shaman was taken aback when he saw the husband from a distance. His face seemed to know something. When he asked the wife if she dared to touch him, and if so, 
If she could assist him in sitting up and pulling the blanket off so he could see the entire body of the husband. The wife did not hesitate. She removed the blanket and assisted her husband in sitting against the wall. The shaman was even more alarmed now that he could see his entire body clearly and he seemed to have confirmed what he had suspected. The shaman inquired about the husband's recent visits to temples or strange places to worship. The husband paused for a moment before responding. Last week, when I went to the city to collect money, I stopped by a temple and worshipped a god. That day after receiving the money, the husband took some time to explore the city. By chance, he came across a temple to which a large number of people had come to pay their respects. The temple looked very spacious. He went to visit and pray for the next jobs to go well because he has many new plans at work, but he has never worshipped any gods before. However, when he arrived at the main hall, he discovered that there were too many people. He waited for quite a long time, but there was still no room for him to bow down. So he suddenly remembered that there was a road next to the main hall that led to another shrine. He decided to go there to have a look, but strangely, no one came to visit. But he believed that gods were gods, so he knelt and begged for what he desired. When the shaman heard this, he immediately asked him if he remembered the figure of that god as he was most likely punished for kneeling on the ground. He sat back and explained that it was a god with a fierce face, a large snake wrapped around its arms and neck and his feet stepping on many skulls. The shaman was taken aback by what he had just heard and he explained that it was the god who represented the epidemic and he was not a suitable god to beg for business so he was punished. When they heard this, both husband and wife were terrified and worried about how to get rid of this punishment, so they begged the shaman to assist the husband in getting rid of his pain. The old shaman was eager to help, but he was also concerned that he would fail. First of all, they must prepare the offerings for an apology to that god. The next day at the appointed auspicious hour, the husband knelt beneath the altar while the shaman wielded a wooden sword and danced around him. On the table were three offerings, a buffalo head, a pig head, and a goat head. The husband's condition improved the following day, and the pustules subsided as well. However, because the family's business did not go well after that, the shaman advised the husband to take a break from work for a while in order for the punishment to subside. So the wife went on her husband's behalf to complete the family's work. Although the postules left many scars on the husband's face and body, after he recovered from the disease, he still considered himself fortunate to be cured and to be able to live his life. At the end of last year, I had an offer of an internship at a famous private hospital in the city downtown. Working in the emergency department was under a lot of pressure. I also witnessed many sad and weird stories. One day, a group of doctors on duty was rushing to bring the corpse of an unfortunate patient to the morgue for the procedure. They quickly entered the hospital elevator. Reaching the top floor, which is also the hospital's morgue, the elevator door opened slowly and revealed a mysterious light ahead. They took the corpse out of the elevator, but couldn't stop feeling curious about the appearance of the strange light spot. But when they went along the hallway, it was as dark as usual. The light had disappeared, leaving only one room with the door open. One of them felt very strange because the place has never been visited except hospital staff. If doctors of the hospital were there, they wouldn't leave the door open like that. Although thinking for a while, the group of doctors could not answer their curiosity. Finally, they brought the body inside the morgue. When the door of the morgue was closed, in the middle of the corridor, an old man wearing a hospital uniform suddenly appeared. He staggered in the cold corridors, his 
eyes were white and his skin was pale. At the same time, the victim's body was also brought inside the room which was filled with the smell of corpses. Two young doctors stood at both ends of the corpse, which was covered with a white cloth. They slowly brought it to the bed. But when they had just picked up the body, the two doctors were astonished to realize there was only one empty sheet on their hands. They put the sheet on the bed. Indeed, there was no corpse underneath it, which caused the doctors to be extremely worried and confused. After thinking for a while, the doctors concluded that the body may be fell to the ground on the way there. They discussed and agreed to cover the bed with a white sheet. They pretended that the body had been successfully transferred to the morgue. Then they separated to find the body before dawn. In order to avoid being known by their superiors, the doctors quickly packed up and left the morgue. Three of them continued to push this bed out, walking slowly towards the hospital elevator. After that, they went in to try to find it, but the inside of the elevator was empty. There was no body. But when the door was just closed, the strange old patient appeared again in a mysterious and barbaric look. The only slipper under his foot seemed to be house slippers, but it didn't make any sound. He was walking and trembling. His steps were also very slow and short because his health seemed to be very weak. He walked with heavy steps because his whole body seemed to be uncontrolled. It swayed unsteadily. He went to the door of the stairs, pushing it with force. The sound of the door pulling echoed throughout the dark hospital corridor. He walked down step by step like a person who had just lost all his soul. He went towards the main hall of the hospital. At that time, the lights in the main hall had turned off. The whole space was very quiet. On the wall, the clock was already past 1 a.m. In the middle of the hall, the nurse on the duty that night was sitting to arrange a pile of papers and medical records to hand over to the next day's shift. The young nurse was very attentive. Her eyes did not leave the documents for a second. She worked hard to take notes and do calculations. In the distance, a dark shadow was walking heavy steps towards her without her noticing. When the black shadow was no longer far from her, the approaching footsteps also sounded more and more clear. She stopped her work and looked up. The man in front of her kept walking calmly. Looking at his appearance and outfit, she assumed that he must be an absent-minded elderly patient. Seeing that someone came to bother her at this time, she was very upset. She didn't look up at the old man in front of her. She waited for him to take out a piece of paper. Then he put his paper on the desk and asked her to check if the prescription was correct. Before she received the paper, the terrible smell from the old man's body made her cough so violently. She covered her nose with one hand, took the paper from the old man with the other, and told him to stay away from her desk a bit. She took the paper, but as soon as she touched it, the coldness of its surface made her want to withdraw her hand. After that, she put the paper on the desk, and then waited until the smell from the old man's body was gone before starting to work. She looked at the paper and read each word carefully. It was indeed a prescription, but the patient's name startled her. She read and reread his patient's name. The feeling was so familiar that it surprised her. She tried to remember. Earlier, she had heard many people say that there was a very critical emergency patient in the heart department. He was an old man who had a heart attack. Although the doctors tried to save him, he did not survive. The nurse remembered this detail, and suddenly she felt cold throughout her body. Her hands trembled and lost the feeling. She slowly looked up at the patient who was standing opposite her. The man's face appeared in front of her. She looked closely at this face and screamed in fear. That was exactly the patient who died from a heart attack earlier. His eyes lit up when he looked at her. He moved closer and closer to her. This man slammed his hands on the desk and kept calling her name. His voice echoed throughout the wide hospital hall, which made the nurse almost faint. 
He kept begging her to check his prescription. Meanwhile, the layers of his skin also began to decompose, peel off and felt on the desk, which looked very scary. After a while, the old man suddenly stopped talking, but those bright eyes were still staring at the nurse. The nurse at that moment could not control her fear, so she immediately shouted, stood up and ran away. Hearing the screams, another nurse on the shift rushed out from the break room to see what happened. Her colleague just arrived and saw her falteringly pointing forward. Her mouth did not open. There was an elderly patient in front of the desk. She immediately came to intervene. But when she got there, his face scared her. When she looked at him closely, the female colleague realized that it was the passaway patient that she treated in the emergency room. The horrifying truth made both nurses unable to control their fear. So they shouted at that same time to wake up the whole hospital which startled everyone. Hearing the loud screams of the nurses, the hospital guards from their rooms also rushed up to check. But when they got there, the story took a different turn. Two security guards ran after the screams, went to the main hall of the hospital and used flashlights to shine inside. Both of them tried calling loudly, but there was no answer inside. When entering, the security guard saw one female nurse fainted on the ground. No one know what is the cause of her fainting. The other nurse had a pale face and a blank expression. She was still sitting on a chair and muttering to herself. After saying that she had seen a ghost, she fainted. The two security guards didn't understand what was going on. They hurriedly brought two nurses to the emergency room to check. After waking up, the female nurse who had sat in the main hall had a problem with her mental health. She was always in a state of panic. She always said that she had met a ghost and asked people around for help, but no one knew what the beginning of the story was. The other female nurse was so shocked about what happened the previous night that she could not keep her life and died the next morning. The body that the doctors were looking for was also found at the bottom of the stairs leading to the morgue. It looked like the body had fallen from above. In the end, these events made the nurse so obsessed that she had to quit her job and undergo psychiatric treatment for a while. She later learned that because of the unfortunate nurse's negligence, the old patient had had a heart attack and died without anyone knowing. This horror story was very popular at the hospital where I worked as an intern for a long time. Today, it is still an obsession with the people on night duty. This horrifying event occurred when I was young and studying in an old vocational school. I came from the countryside at that time, so I had to stay in the school's dormitory. I also had two other female friends, Lily and Anna, who came from another rural area to study and stayed in the same dormitory as me. <laughs> Lily was very attractive and pursued by many people, whereas Anna was shy and had never mentioned love before. On the contrary, she was solely focused on her studies. Our dormitory was very cold and dark at night because it was built more than 10 years ago. That was why Anna never wanted to do the bathroom alone. That night, I was falling asleep when I heard someone calling out to me and shaking me to wake me up. I slowly opened my eyes to see what was wrong. Anna was standing next to the bed, her face a little shy, but she wanted me to go to the bathroom with her. Because I was used to it, it didn't bother me so I agreed right away. The two of us went to the bathroom together and didn't forget to tease her about how shy she was on the way. But in a trembling voice, she stated that this school had been haunted for a long time and that the ghost story was well known to everyone. I didn't believe in ghosts, so when I heard those words, I didn't pay much attention, even laughing at her that she had heard fake news and was scared for no reason. Then I walked away. 
returned to the bedroom as soon as possible. And Anna, after hearing what I said, seemed angry because I didn't believe what she said. So Anna chased after me. Her face became more serious, her voice no longer trembling, and she tried to tell me the story of the ghost in red who haunted this school. It was a female demon who committed suicide out of love and thus couldn't flee. I was still not interested in this story and when we arrived to the bathroom I just told her to go quickly and return as soon as possible. But Anna was a coward. She didn't want me to wait outside. Instead, she told me to go inside and wait. Seeing Anna's fear, I had no choice but to go inside as she instructed and stood close to the wall to look over. This toilet was in desperate need of repair because it was too old. Suddenly, a gust of cold air blew from nowhere, causing my entire body to shiver uncontrollably. Obviously, this was a closed room, so how could there be such a breeze? So, I urged Anna to hurry up and return as soon as possible. When I turned to have a look at the toilet that Anna was using, I noticed something strange. It was the room next to Anna's that was also being used by an other person. I wasn't sure when she was there, but Anna and I walked in and didn't notice her. What was odd was that she was wearing red high heels instead of slippers like the rest of us. It was after midnight, the dorms were closed, no one should dress up to go out at this time, and wearing high heels to the bathroom was unusual. Although I wasn't afraid of ghosts, seeing that scene made me nervous, so I knocked on Anna's door and continued to urge her. Anna's face was slightly irritated when she walked out as a result of my constant prodding. I didn't say much, just told her that I needed to get back to my room. Anna teased me at the time because she thought standing outside alone made me scared while I dared to say I wasn't afraid of ghosts. I didn't dare to mention the strange woman next to Anna's room because I knew she was very cowardly, so I sneaked a glance to confirm once more if it was really human after all. But unexpectedly, the woman in red shoes vanished and the bathroom was deserted. I couldn't only reassure myself that I was mistaken because I had heard Anna's story and imagined it myself. After that, we returned to the bedroom and I decided not to tell Anna what I had seen. I quickly fell asleep, but no longer after my entire body went numb and it became difficult to breathe as a someone was pressing against me. The air became very cold. I heard the door being opened very loudly. A woman dressed in bright red dress with long black hair stood there. I panicked and took a close look at the woman. Her face was extremely frightening. Her wide mouth was full of blood. Her eyes without pupils, only white, and her neck appeared to have been squeezed by something, leaving a fairly obvious mark. Her dress was ripped, but the scariest part was that she was wearing a pair of red high heels, the same ones I saw in the bathroom just before. She was also floating with her feet barely touching the ground. Apparently, she was the female demon Anna mentioned. She just hovered like that and came to Anna's bed. Anna suddenly sat up, not hearing any voice or movement from her. I could only see Anna sat up as if she was ordered to do so by the demon. Anna's eyes were lifeless, like a sleepwalker, and her skin had turned pale. And I jumped out of bed and began walking slowly across my bed, right behind the female demon. And I lowered her face, but her body continued to walk unconsciously. I was terrified, but I didn't want Anna to follow the demon, so I screamed and tried to stop her. But my mouth was glued shut. I couldn't open it, and my body was heavy and numb. So, I had no choice but to watch Anna follow the demon out of the room. I was dreaming when I was startled awake by a scream. When I awoke, I opened my eyes and saw that the room was lit, indicating that it was all a dream. Looking at the door, I noticed Lily and other girls from the other room gathered outside. 
it appeared that something had happened to Anna because the roommate next door appeared very concerned. She said with a serious face and trembling voice, something happened to Anna and she asked everyone to come to have a look. Anna was in the bathroom. I looked over at Anna's bed and she was no longer there. I began to be concerned about my dream last night. We were all panicked and at the time rushed there to see Anna's situation in my heart. I just hoped she didn't meet anything serious. Lily was the first to arrive and I still didn't know what happened to Anna. When I heard Lily scream in fear, I was startled as well. I also rushed inside to watch as most heinous thing I could not bear happening right in front of my eyes. Anna was dead. She was sitting on the floor, her skin pale. Could it be that my dream from the previous night came true and it was the female demon who killed her? Anna's eyes wide open but white and her face no longer had blood stains and she died because she cut her own wrist. The blood was all over the floor and she must have been in great pain. Later, Anna's family members joined the procession to return Anna's body to her hometown. They also had a heated debate with the school while the school claiming that Anna committed suicide out of love. But I knew Anna had never had a lover and would never do something so stupid. I couldn't get a good sleep after that night. When I recalled the scene on the day Anna died, I always got agitated. In a dream, I saw Anna standing next to the bed, chortling me awake. Seeing Anna again made me very happy and despite the fact that she was dead, I felt no fear. However, Anna appeared to be in a hurry. She simply stated that I needed to go and immediately drew my hand out of bed. I looked down and saw that the cut on Anna's wrist was still open and that the blood was flowing. I began to panic because I remembered the demon in red, afraid that she would have transformed into Anna and seduced me the same way she had taken Anna away that night, so I struggled to fight back. Anna's face erupted in rage. She held and dashed towards me. She rushed to me yelling that there was no time and that I must leave immediately. I awoke from my dream at the same time I heard Lily scream. We exchanged glances and discussed the previous dream. Strangely, Lily had the same dream as me. We believed that Anna wanted us to leave the building for a reason. So without a doubt, we dashed to the door and fled as quickly as we could. As soon as we arrived on the ground floor, a plume of black smoke rose out from the floor. Lily and I were both terrified and had no idea what was going on. The fire broke out after a few minutes and spread to the other floors of the building. Fortunately, we could escape in time. Lily and I stood dumbfounded, looking up at our windows, where a figure stood staring at us. It was Anna looking at us through the windows with a happy smile on her face. It turned out that Anna was the one who saved us from the fire. Perhaps it was because this was the last thing she wanted to do for us that her smile was so satisfying. The story happened to my college friend Jindo when he was young, about 12 years old. At that time, Jindo's family was also well off. Although living in the countryside, their lives were relatively sufficient. The story involved a strange black cat. On a sweltering summer night, Jindo was awakened by a cry which was like a baby crying. Curious, Jindo crawled closer to the window to see where the cry was coming from. 
Around him both mom and dad were sleeping soundly. Jindo looked through the window. There was a black cat standing on the roof of the opposite house, which is his grandfather's house. Looking closer, he felt quite strange, because the black cat was standing on its hind legs like a human and acting quite strangely and confusingly. It was like the cat was dancing. The eyes of the cat suddenly lit up with a ghostly blue light. His mouth was howling with pitiful screams, which was very shrill and scary. Being too young, Jindo didn't know what he was doing, so he could only be still and peek through the window passionately. The black cat continued dancing like it was praying for something, which looked like rites of the shamans in the movies we often saw. Suddenly a voice went out to interrupt Jindo's training of thought. He turned around and saw his mother. Because it was midnight and Jindo still hadn't slept, she scolded him. After hearing the mother complain, Jindo suddenly remembered the black cat, so he still tried to look over the opposite house and wonder if the black cat was still dancing or not. But maybe hearing the voice of Jindo and his mother, the cat stopped standing on his two feet and glanced at Jindo with those blue eyes. Then he jumped away and disappeared. Fearing that his mother would worry, Jindo also quickly returned to his bed to continue sleeping. Jindo's mother also wondered what Jindo was looking at outside the window intently at midnight. The next morning everything was fine. Jindo also forgot what he had seen the night before. After lunch, Jindo was planning to go out to play with the neighborhood kids. Suddenly, something caught his eye. It was the black cat the previous night Jindo suddenly remembered all the strange things he had seen. The black cat was lying on the wall and sunbathing like the other normal cats. Hearing the sound, he opened his eyes to look at Jindo. Then I turned to the other direction to sleep again. Jindo had a feeling that the cat was sulking because Jindo had disturbed him last night. But he was young, he didn't care too much about it. Until that night something unexpected and heartbreaking happened to Jindo's family. His grandfather had a stroke and died. By the time he was taken to the hospital, it was too late. The doctor also diagnosed the grandfather couldn't be cured anymore, so he asked Jindo's family to take the grandfather home. As soon as possible, the family gathered to say goodbye to him. Everyone was heartbroken and cried a lot because of the surprising death of Jindo's grandfather. Normally, he was very healthy without any illness, but he passed away so quickly. Jindo is also very sad. He cried a lot. He almost forgot the cat which had danced on the roof of his grandpa's house the previous night. Suddenly, the meow of a cat caught Jindo's attention. The strange thing is that at that time there were many people around but no one noticed the sound of the cat. Maybe everyone was crying about the sad event so they didn't care much. But Jindo was the one who heard the sound the most clearly. He rushed to the glass door and pressed his face against it to see what the black cat was doing. On the dark and winding country road outside, Jindo saw a small black cat ahead, leading someone behind. It was too dark, so he couldn't recognize who was there. The cat kept leading the way and making squeals. Not knowing what to push forward, Jindo ran out into the yard and turned on the front light to illuminate who the black cat was leading. As soon as he turned on the light in front of the house, Jindo was dumbfounded by what he saw. The dim shadow gradually approached under the moonlight and the light that Jindo had just opened. He could clearly see the shape of a man. The black cat was still walking slowly and looking back. It seemed the cat urged the man to go faster. Jindo's eyes widened in surprise because that man was his grandfather. Apparently he had died and his body was still inside the house. How could he appear out here? He shouted for everyone to get out. He said that his grandpa was back and the cat brought him back to his family. Inside, everyone was standing around the grandfather's body to mourn. Suddenly hearing Jindo's screams, they startled and turned their heads to the door. Worried about what happened to Jindo, the family's members panicked and got out together into the yard to see what was going on. 
Jindo stood outside. He innocently said that Grandpa had returned. He pointed at the black cat and firmly asserted that it was the cat that led him home to his family. Everyone stood around the cat and saw nothing but a small black animal, so they thought that Jindo was making up stories to make fun of the family. In the midst of grief, Jindo was scolded by his father for making up stories. Then the family quietly went back inside. They left bewildered Jindo behind. Jindo scratched his head. He blankly looked at the black cat next to him. The animal also looked back at him. Then Jindo thought that maybe he was really wrong. While he was thinking, there was a scream from inside the house. It was Jindo's father. The screams were so loud and panicked that even Jindo was standing in the yard startled. Jindo also got into the house hurriedly to see what caused his father to scream and panic. As soon as he opened the door, Jindo saw his father was sitting on the floor and trembling with fear. Jindo looked up and shouted like his father even more scared because the grandfather's body suddenly could sit up normally on the bed, which scared the whole family so much that everyone fell to the floor. <coughs> Jindo, grandpa, was not a ghost because he sat up and made some dry coughs. His skin was also rosy again like a normal person seeing that the whole family was less afraid. Everybody gradually approached them. They wondered and asked a lot of questions. They didn't dare to believe that he was really alive or not. What they had seen was so strange, almost impossible. Because the hospital confirmed his death and his body also became pale and cold, how could he be revived like a miracle? The body was indeed very warm when touched. At this point, people believed that he was really alive. Jindo's mother also burst into tears of joy. As soon as he stopped coughing, the first question he asked was not about his family, but about the black cat. He said that it had brought him home. No one understood what he was talking about. He hurried to get out of bed and insisted on looking for the black cat despite everyone's objections because of his very weak health. Only Jindo understood what he was talking about. He glanced at the yard, suddenly remembering the black cat which had stood outside. Jindo hurried out into the yard to look for the cat as he realized that this animal had known of his grandfather's death that night. With a strange dance, the cat had been begging for something to help his grandfather. Although Jindo went around, he still couldn't find the black cat. He did not see the cat again in the following years. When Jindo was older, he realized that the figure which he saw that night was the spirit of his grandfather. His grandfather also said that before the event happened, he used to take care of that feral cat for several years. It was a true story that I was told by my father when I was young. It was about a close friend of my father. His name was John. When my father and John were young, about 25 years old, John's father passed away. Because they were very close friends, my father also came to help John take care of his father's funeral. John's family only had him as the eldest brother so he took care of everything with his own hands. That day, after the funeral was held, John had a little time to rest. My father and John stood in the main hall chatting and lighting a cigarette. Suddenly, another person entered the hall and asked to borrow my father's lighter. He was Kang, John's cousin, who was also related by blood, but it didn't seem like Kang and John were very close. My father still happily lent it to him. Although Kang and John were cousins, 
sharing the same bloodline, their personalities were opposite. John was an honest and gentle person and Kang was a troublemaker and his temperament was not very good. But according to John, he didn't know why this time Kang actively helped to arrange the funeral for John's father and was also very enthusiastic. Perhaps witnessing his loved one's death should make him change his mind a bit and be kinder. John had no objections or animosity towards him. At that time, my father felt that John's face looked worse, so he also asked John about his health. John said he couldn't sleep well last night because he saw his father in a dream. But he didn't understand what his father wanted. My father also asked John to tell him about the dream so that both of them could think together. Because the dead often have many unfinished business, it was normal to report dreams to children and grandchildren. John also candidly recounted that he went to bed early last night to start the funeral early today. He had been so busy all day yesterday that he immediately fell asleep as soon as he laid on his back. Suddenly, a cold breath came from nowhere, causing John to wake up. A dim figure also gradually appeared beside his bed. John said that he didn't know why he felt it. So he sat up immediately and saw his father standing next to him. John knew it was just a ghost, but he was unafraid and still talked to his father. In the dream, John's father showed an angry and upset face. His father said that there was one more person in his coffin that made him very uncomfortable. John's father did not like it. John didn't understand what his father was saying. So he asked again, but his father became silent and stopped talking, just looking at him with an annoyed expression. John was about to ask his father again when his father slowly receded, faded and disappeared. No matter how much John reached out and screamed, he couldn't move to get out of bed and run after his father. Finally, John woke up and screamed like in that dream, causing his wife to wake up in a panic. John's wife held him and then called John to sober up. Hearing his wife's call, John came to his senses and knew he was dreaming. After hearing this, my father was also confused. John's father wanted to tell John something but couldn't figure out what it was. There were only John and his wife in this house. All siblings were in their own houses, so what did the older man mean? After discussing for a while, both of them were silent and then looked at the coffin thoughtfully. John wanted to do everything to let his father rest in peace, but he couldn't think of it. Then the two also put that thought aside to go out to receive guests who came to visit outside. People had also visited in large numbers and were sitting at the table drinking and chatting outside, including Fen. He was also a friend of John and my father, but he often traveled far away for work, only returning to his hometown once in a while. Recently, there was also news that his wife had gone away, so John asked Fen about it as well. Fen had a sullen face. He said that since he'd returned home the other day, he had not seen his wife. Fen had searched and inquired everywhere, but couldn't find her. He was asking the police to search for help. Finn was also worried about his wife. Hearing that, a person sitting at the same table also said that Finn's wife had been rumored to be a cheater and adulterer for a long time. Since Finn worked all the time and was rarely at home, his wife might have packed up and gone with her lover. John was a kind person, so he put his hand on the neighbor's shoulder and advised him not to say cruel words. If that weren't the case, it would be a mistake. The funeral took place in three days. Neighbors, friends and relatives had also fully paid their respects to John's father. John was also extremely busy in those days. After three days, it was time to go to the burial. At that time, cremation was still not widely used, so burial was common. John was the eldest son, so he hugged his father's photo and went first. 
Everyone was sad and heartbroken, so the crying resounded all the way. Four strong men were responsible for carrying the coffin and going behind. The group went about halfway when suddenly, in the sky, black clouds pulled up like a storm. John looked ahead and saw clouds covering the sky. It looked like a big storm was coming. My father said it might rain soon, so they had to find somewhere to shelter or hurry to go. John decided to go straight to the burial place because it was not far, and there was no place to stay around. My father also told the coffin bearers to try to go fast. They also agreed and together tried to get there in time. So the whole group continued to go. Behind them, they heard the sound of heavy rain. Maybe the rain would come here soon. Not long after, the rain had come to white. The sky was filled with terrible thunderstorms. Lightning seemed to tear the sky apart. Suddenly, there was a loud, deafening explosion. The tree by the roadside was hit by lightning, creating a terrifying scene that made everyone panic. The tree that was hit by lightning burned and immediately fell. Unfortunately, the tree fell on top of the coffin, causing the coffin to be so heavy that the support it was carrying broke and the coffin fell to the ground. The tree made a big crack on the coffin's lid and the rain fell inside the coffin. Everyone panicked when they saw the scene and didn't know what to do because it was the first time they encountered such a strange thing. After regaining their composure, the group decided to lift the tree together and open the coffin lid. Because the trunk was too heavy, it would most likely press on the older man's body, causing the older man's body to be injured and not be intact for burial. When they opened the coffin lid, they were surprised and scared. Not only the older man's body, but also the body of a woman in the coffin. Looking at the woman's body, it seemed to have been dead for a few days. The woman's body was lying on top of the older man's body. After taking a closer look, they realized that this woman was Fen's wife. She had been reported missing for a few days. Of course, it was not possible to continue burying at this time. Jean immediately reported it to the police for them to come and solve. By the time the police arrived, the rain had stopped. The police also took statements from everyone present at the scene and those related to this woman. After a day of investigation, they also found the suspect. He was Kang, John's cousin. The police arrested him to get his statement. Seeing that he could no longer deny the crime, Kang confessed that he and the other woman had been having an illicit relationship with each other for a while. Her husband was often away for work. So Kang would come over to her house when her husband was away and sleep together. Suddenly one day, she suggested to Kang about running away to another place to live and get married. That took Kang by surprise as he had never thought of living with her. Kang just wanted to have fun crossing the street with her. That made Fen's wife very angry she thought that Kang was playing with her, so she got into a fight with him. Kang is also not a nice person. Being cursed makes him get angry and then argue back. The two argued for a while. No one would give up. At the climax, Kang used his hand to squeeze the woman's neck. No matter how much she cried and groaned, he didn't care. She quickly stopped breathing and lay on the ground. Only then did Kang realize that he had killed someone. This made him worry. At the same time, he heard the news that Jun's father had passed away, so he immediately thought of a plan. He went to find Jun pretending to be sad and then asked Jun to let him help with the funeral. That night, when everyone was asleep, Kang wrapped the woman's body in a blanket and carried it to Jun's house. With a sinister expression, Kang quietly went to the main hall where the coffin was located and gently opened the coffin lid. Kang placed his lover's body in the coffin next to Jun's father's body and then carefully closed the lid of the coffin so that no one would know. Since the coffin would never be opened by anyone and would be buried, 
He thought he would be able to hide his crime, but he did not expect that what he did was also an insult to the deceased, so he was punished. After that, the funeral continued. The older man was finally given a proper burial. This story happened to my cousin Can. After getting married, he decided to buy a house on the edge of the city. So he decided to find a reputable real estate company to buy himself a new house. That day, both Mr. and Mrs. Can went to see the house, and the real estate side also sent a broker to work with them. This employee was very resourceful, enthusiastically taking my cousin and his wife to see the house. True to Can's wish, the house was not far from the city, just over 30 minutes by car. Mr. Can would go to work every day. Moreover, the price of the house was very good. According to the broker, the owner finished the building not long ago. They all moved to another city, so the house was completely new. There was a point that the broker said that caught my cousin's attention that the house was located on the main road so cars could move easily and the house was also located at the junction. The front of the house was extremely spacious and airy. Because my cousin didn't care too much about Feng Shui, just listening to what the broker said, he felt satisfied. He thought that since the house was located on the main road, it was convenient for commuting. Going into the yard, both my brother and sister-in-law were satisfied because the yard was very spacious. It was possible to do a lot of things such as drying clothes, planting trees. Inside the house everything was clean. Like the broker said that the house was almost brand new. Perhaps the previous owner only stayed for a few months and Can didn't know why they moved. But Can didn't pay much attention only knowing that the house was very satisfactory and the price was very cheap. Perhaps only half the price of such houses. So he decided to buy it. Of course, the broker was happy. He also made the contract. And Mr. Khan also transferred the money the same day. Mr. Khan was an agile person, so as soon as the payment was done, the following day he also started to move his belongings and move in. Before they came to see it, everything in the house was clean. They only moved their belongings in and could stay the same night. Everything was working fine, no problem. The following morning, Mr. and Mrs. Khan began to clean and redecorate the house. Sister-in-law was hanging clothes while Mr. Khan was sweeping the yard to keep it clean. Because the house was located at the junction, the yard was very dusty and full of leaves. Mr. Can also swept it from the inside and out the front door. Suddenly, he saw something. It was a large stone placed next to the gate with very strange red inscriptions written on it. That made him think for a long time. He didn't see it yesterday. He probably didn't notice it nor did he hear the broker say anything about it. He thought this was just a decoration of the former owner like some houses often leave two stone tiger statues in front of the house. They must have forgotten to take it away when moving house. Without thinking much, Mr. Khan used all his strength and started to move the stone away. It was heavy, so Mr. Khan also had a hard time moving it. Despite his best efforts, Khan couldn't lift the stone. Finally, he decided to roll it into the grass by the roadside. After struggling for a while, Mr. Khan also moved it to a nearby bush. After finishing work, he quickly returned to sweep the yard. That night, strange things began to happen, leaving the family unsettled for the rest of the time. While sleeping, my sister-in-law was awakened by something. It sounded like people walking and talking. It seemed to be coming from the front yard of the house. At that time, she thought maybe Kana had forgotten to lock the door before sleeping, so the thief was sneaking into the house. She was a little worried. 
my sister-in-law didn't dare go out to watch alone, so she tried to wake my brother up. My brother was tired all day, so he slept like a dead knight, and my sister-in-law tried to call but couldn't wake him up. It took him a while to wake up, his eyes still half closed and his voice sleepy. He asked his wife what happened in the end, because it was too late now, why still asked him to wake up? Sister-in-law also taught Khan about the noises she had just heard earlier. After hearing that Khan turned into the nightlight and walked alone to the main door, he remembers that he locked the door very carefully before going to sleep. There was no way a thief broke the door without realizing it. He thought his wife had misheard, so he very leisurely opened the door to take a look outside. But as soon as he opened the door to look out, his face also began to change, his eyes widened and his mouth opened wide in surprise as if he was afraid of something. He quickly closed the door and then crouched against the wall, his face bewildered, no more blood from panic. My sister-in-law was also extremely scared when she saw her husband like that. She also asked him about what was happening outside the door, but he still dared not to say a word. Perhaps he was in a state of panic at that time. It took a while for Khan to stammer a few words, not sure what was going on. Only he said that there was ghosts outside. Hearing that, my sister-in-law also broke out in a cold sweat. Gathering up her courage, she also approached to double check if it was true what Khan said. At this time the two people did not dare to open the main door anymore but only slightly lifted the window curtain to look outside. His wife's face was the same as Khan's earlier. Her eyes widened in horror because outside the courtyard right now three ghosts were floating around. In the middle of the pitch black night the other three ghosts were white and had no legs making everyone look scary. My brother and his wife could completely see their faces, including one young and two older people. Their skin and eyes were also white. At this time the couple was so scared that they could only hug each other. That whole night neither of them dared to sleep, nor did they dare to make any movement, only hugging each other and staying awake until morning. When they saw that the sun had risen, they dared to open the door and step outside to see if the ghosts had gone or not. Of course, with the sun no ghost would dare to stay. At this time Khan was angry, thinking that the broker had sold them a house with dead and haunted people. Khan immediately went straight to the brokerage company to deal with them. Khan thought he had been cheated, so the house price was so cheap. Inside the company Khan made the broker who introduced him to the house that day. Too angry Khan immediately rushed in and cursed violently. Seeing that the broker did not know anything his face was also innocent. Khan was even angrier because he thought the broker was doing it on purpose. At this time the broker still didn't know what was going on and made Khan angry so he still tried to comfort him. However. Khan pushed his hand away and continued to talk about the haunted house. Khan also said that he saw a ghost in his yard last night and said that the brokerage company knew about it but still deliberately kept it a secret. At this point the broker was very surprised because he did not know about it. So he immediately called the old owner to ask. He also seemed very angry when he heard that phone call. It seemed that the old owner's side had lied in his matter. After hearing the old owner confessing everything and telling the truth, he also hung up the phone to apologize to Khan. This thing was due to the negligence of the company because it did not thoroughly research the house. After apologizing he also explained about the problem of the house that Khan was facing, which was Feng Shui. The old owner of the house said that the Feng Shui of the house was not good but had found a teacher to overcome it. So nothing would have happened unless Mr. Khan had moved the stone in front of the house. It was a popular amulet for houses with a bad position. The stone would keep the family away from bad luck and calamities. Khan saw the ghosts last night because he moved the stone. Because when building the house the old owner did not consider Feng Shui. 
They had built the house at the junction and had a road leading directly to the house, so how many souls cannot escape and how much bad luck would also go straight from that direction to the house. Knowing the truth, Khan quickly put the stone back in its place and after that he did not see anything strange anymore. But after a while, he still felt uncomfortable here, so he sold the house. But unlike the previous owner, Khan did not hide the house. Because of the low price, finally a family bought it. As long as they didn't move the stone, nothing would happen. After graduating from college, I was able to find a job. It was an old psychiatric hospital on the outskirts of town. This hospital was already too good for me based on my average graduation score. The work there was also relatively easy for a beginner like me. But a close friend of mine told me that there was a murder at the hospital last week and it was rumored that the doctors were responsible for torturing a patient to death. But the hospital kept the case hidden because the female patient had no relatives so no one was prosecuted. In the early days of my job, I frequently arrived home late from work. My colleagues Kai and Song also assisted me greatly. They were doctors with several years of experience. Kai abruptly asked me after changing clothes if I had heard rumors about patients being tortured to death in this hospital. I also responded honestly about what I heard earlier, which I didn't mind at all. We also began to walk down the corridor to leave, while the two of them continued to discuss the rumor. I could hear what seemed to be a female patient. On the way to the main hall, the clock bell suddenly rang so loudly that I almost fell over. So Song began teasing me, because as a doctor, I would be required to work at night so frequently but I was still so nervous that even the sound of a bell startled me. Kai then looked at his watch and told me, somewhat solemnly, that I needed to hurry up so that I could leave the hospital as soon as possible. When Song heard that, he turned and walked quickly and I sensed their urgencies and a little bit of anxiety. I didn't know why but they appeared to be afraid of something, perhaps because the hospital at night was too creepy. I didn't think much either and was about to turn around to follow them when a cry from back of the hallway caught my attention and I turned to look, because there was no patient's room near the source of the crying. When the other two heard it and turned to look, I asked if there was a patient room on that side. I was afraid that if a patient went out of their room inadvertently like that, it wouldn't be anything good for them. However, as soon as I asked, the two of them stammered and made scared faces, claiming that they didn't hear anything and that I must have misheard. I didn't think so, but since they didn't believe me, I offered to go into the hallway to double check and told them to go ahead or wait for me to return. Song stopped me just as I was about to leave, telling me to ignore it and go home. It was now too late to go back there to check but it wouldn't be too late to come early the next morning. Hearing this, I wasn't sure why I was so enraged, because I believed they were doctors with many years of experience, but they didn't seem to really care about their patients, which disappointed me. So I ignored their words and walked alone in the hallway. The other girl's cry grew louder. I was just afraid she was stuck somewhere and couldn't get out, and the other two stood there looking at me without saying anything. Following the cry I arrived in front of a room which I normally saw but never entered because the staff in the hospital said it was no longer in use. 
I opened the door to have a look. There was no light inside. It was dark as ink. Only the moonlight shining through the window. There was no one inside and the furniture was covered in white sheets and there was one rocking wooden horse. The crying had stopped and I wondered if I had been misheard so I quickly turned around to close the door and go home. But two black shadows appeared from behind me, causing me to scream in terror. It turned out to be Kai and Song. The two of them seemed to have some humanity. Seeing that I had been gone for a long time, they decided to come check it out. Seeing me startled, they were also a little amusing. Then they asked if I had found the patient and where the crying was coming from. But I told them that I hadn't seen anyone on the way. There was no one in the room as well as the crying had stopped, possibly because I was too suspicious. Seeing this, they urged me to come back because it was nearly 2 o'clock in the morning. I was also struggling to turn around and close the door before going back home, but then I noticed something that stunned me. The rocking horse I saw earlier in the room was swaying automatically without any wind impact. And the scary thing was that the silhouette of a person sitting on the horse reflected on the floor in the dim moonlight. After a while, they didn't see me behind them, so Kai and Song turned to look for me, and they saw me still standing like a statue at the door of the room. So they called out to me, and this was when I began stuttering about the strange object in the room. The two other turned to have a look as well, and when they saw what was going on, they turned pale and sweaty, as if they were hiding something. There was no more crying, only a very creepy laugh, and my body trembled with fear. At the same time, Kai quickly turned away, not forgetting to urge us to leave as soon as possible. Unexpectedly, Song did not follow us, but instead turned completely towards the room, his body stiff as if controlled by something, and gradually entered the room, much to our surprise. At this point, a woman appeared next to the rocking horse, and I could feel tremors emanating from Song's body. His face was also terrified, but unable to resist. Song quickly approached the other woman. It was clear that Song knew about her because as soon as he saw her, he begged her to spare his life, claiming that he didn't hurt her intentionally. Her face was also visible in the moonlight, I could see her pale white skin and deep black eye sockets devoid of pupils. She was clearly not in the form of a human. Kai also started screaming in panic, begging her to forgive him. Was she the patient who was tortured by the doctors and the rumors? Before I could figure it out, Kai turned and ran away. I tried to call him back to help Song, but he didn't care, maybe because he was too scared. I saw Song, on the other hand, moved his body for a while to resist, but once he could escape from the overpowering, Song quickly turned around and ran away from the ghost. But the door was controlled by a supernatural force, and as soon as Song ran to it, it slammed shut, separating me and Song. There was no way I could open it to save him. Song screamed in vain, and I continued to try to open the door. At this point, I was still unaware of the danger in front of us, and I had no idea what was going on in the end. The ghost was gliding behind Song, a strange smile on her lips, and she was whispering something to Song that I couldn't hear. But Song seemed to panic, and he turned back quickly, looking at the ghost. His tears streamed down his cheeks, and his mouth was constantly begging for forgiveness. The ghost appeared out of nowhere, drew out a sharp iron needle, smiled sinisterly and said, Enjoy the pain of being stabbed by this needle. Despite Song's pleas, she approached him and began repeatedly stabbing him, causing Song to scream in pain. When I saw that, I couldn't think any longer and simply turned around and ran as fast as I could hoping to get out of here as soon as possible. Song's screams echoed hauntingly behind me, but I didn't dare to pause for a second. I kept running, but I couldn't seem to get out of this corridor. It had never been that long before. I came to a halt when I noticed a figure standing in front of me. 
I raised my voice to confirm who it was because I was afraid the ghost would disguise herself as a human in order to harm me. But the familiar voice also asked who I was, only now did I realize it was Kai. Why was he still here? He should have escaped from the hospital a long time ago, but he himself wasn't sure why he couldn't get out. Kai also inquired about Song's situation and I informed him of everything. Kai appeared terrified. I purposefully asked why the ghost would harm people in such a way, but Kai dodged my question and refused to answer it. We couldn't get out in the end, so we decided to hide in a room. Inside the room there was a table covered in white fabric, so we hid under that table. We were muttering about how to get out of here when we noticed two white feet standing through the gap between the table and the floor. Kai was so terrified that he covered his mouth with his hands to avoid making a sound, but she might have noticed us because she was cursing. When the table was knocked over, Kai and I both panicked, tears streaming down our cheeks. She pointed her finger at Kai's face and declared that anyone who harmed her would be held accountable for their crimes. Then she raised her clawed hands and rushed towards Kai as if she wanted to eat Kai alive. He was so terrified that he urinated in his pants while covering his face with his hands and refusing to look at the ghost. The ghost rushed over and tightly wrapped her hand around his neck, her face fierce and frightening. I sat next to her, my legs shaking, unable to move. I closed my eyes and ears, hoping it was all a dream. Kai was unconsciously lying on the ground. I wasn't sure if he was dead or alive. The ghost turned to look at me. Would I meet the same dead end like them? But in the end, she didn't do anything to me. Perhaps because I was innocent. The ghost stared at me for a long time before slowly vanishing. Leaving Kai and me in that cold room, I was so terrified that I fainted right away. The next day, all three of us were taken to the hospital. Neither of us were seriously injured and I also reported the incident to the police. Following that, the police thoroughly investigated the case. Song and Kai, as well as some related people, were all summoned to the court to receive their sentences, and I resigned immediately after being discharged from the hospital, which seemed like a nightmare to me. A nightmare that I would never forget. The story was about a friend of mine, Hiro. He and I were two very close friends and we told each other everything. At the time I heard that he had a girlfriend, but he still didn't introduce her to friends, so I asked. But instead of being happy, he seemed to scowl at me because his girlfriend recently had bad luck and her health was not good. He couldn't introduce her to friends. The couple had only known each other for a few months. Hiro's girlfriend was named Umi. She was an office worker with a relatively pretty appearance, but she had a strange hobby of wearing wigs. Maybe because her real hair was very thinning, she was self-deprecating about it. Moreover, wigs were also very convenient, so she could change the style at any time she liked. Umi had always been collecting pretty hair for a long time, that time she also bought another set. That time the new hairstyle was a bit more special than the old ones. She was very satisfied and always wore it every time she went out the house. She even wore it to work. All the colleagues she met complimented her look. Thanks to her hair she looked prettier. Her long smooth black hair didn't look like a wig at all. It made Umi very pleased, but her face didn't look very happy because since having a new wig, 
Umi also had some strange troubles. She spent quite a lot of money to buy it. The hair seller said that because it was made completely from real hair, the wig was very light and could be styled freely without fear of damage. At first, Umi was a little hesitant when hearing about real hair, but the hair seller said that because there was a girl short of money, cut her hair and sold it for a high price, finally Umi also decided to buy it. But every time I wore it, Umi also had an uncomfortable feeling. She sometimes sensed a strong smell of blood. Umi's body also suddenly appeared strange things. Umi's neck started to develop large blisters which made her very shy as well as painful. Even eating and drinking she did not feel good any longer because the fishy smell kept lingering in her nose which made her moody all day at work. When getting home, Umi quickly took off her hair and put it on the wick stand. Then, without thinking much, Umi prepared the clothes and got into the bathroom. Umi thought maybe the body was too tired, which caused the taste not to be good. While taking a bath, Umi was also extremely alarmed because not only her neck but also her skull began to develop blisters. It made her unable to scrub her skull because she immediately felt painful when touching the blisters. Following that, it was hair loss. Every time she stroked or washed her hair, she was left with a handful of hair. It made Umi feel extremely sad. She quickly finished taking a shower and went to bed to relax. She thought that she had contracted a disease, so she planned to go to the hospital for a checkup on the weekend when she had a day off from work. But when she just slept for a while, the nightmare began to come and made Umi sweat all over the mattress. In dream, she saw herself walking down a long corridor. The white walls had become very old, even darkened and smelled of smoke. Suddenly, Umi heard someone whispering in her ear, but she couldn't hear what the voice was talking about. She only knew that it was very deep and heavy. Suddenly, Umi felt someone behind her. Umi turned around reflexively. There was a woman standing a few feet away and looking at her. The scary thing was that the woman had a very creepy shape. She had no hair while her whole scalp was almost gone. Her eyes did not have pupils anymore but only two incredibly deep black eye sockets. She didn't say anything and didn't give Umi time to run away, but immediately rushed at Umi with an extremely angry expression. Her fingernails were so long that they were dug into Umi's neck which made her breathe difficult and felt extreme pain. Umi tried to resist and then she woke up in fear. She put her hands on her neck to check. The pain was better. It was not like a normal dream and it was clearly real that Umi was strangled. Suddenly, Umi's gaze found someone's shadow which she imprinted on the blanket she was covering when she was alone in the house. Extremely frightened, she quickly turned her face to the direction of the black shadow. A woman with long hair that looked exactly like the wig Umi bought a few days before. She stood next to Umi's bed with long hair covering her whole face. Still the same deep and heavy voice from the recent nightmare, she slowly climbed into bed and approached Umi. Her face also began to be shown clearly behind the hair. It was the woman of her dreams, the rotten face of her Umi couldn't be mistaken. At this point, despite panicking, Umi told herself she couldn't just sit still like what she had done in a dream. Maybe that woman would kill her. Umi shrank back, leaned against the wall and reached out her hand to turn on the light switch. Very soon after that, the whole room was lit up. As soon as there was light, the scary woman also disappeared. She left only the wig floating in the air. Of course, no one else wore it anymore so it quickly fell from the air in front of Umi's eyes. After a few minutes of standing still because of being so surprised, Umi came closer and picked up the wig. In her mind at that moment she was extremely scared. She also suddenly realized that her body had many strange things since wearing the wig. Frightened, Umi quickly called Hiro and explained everything. Soon, Hiro was at his girlfriend's house because Umi's voice was so panicky on the phone that Hiro was also worried. As soon as he entered the room, Hiro also felt the atmosphere was extremely uncomfortable, especially when standing in front of the wig. 
he also sensed a strong smell of blood in his nose. But looking at Umi's scared expression, Hiro told himself to calm down. He didn't dare say that he also smelled blood like Umi did, so Hiro tried to comfort her. He said that maybe it was just a dream. But Umi was very sure that when she saw the woman in her room, she was completely conscious, and Umi also remembered the woman's face clearly. While listening to Umi's story and feeling something unpleasant from the wig, Hiro did not refute Umi's words. He looked at the wig and pondered for a while. Then Hiro cheerfully told her to bring the hair back to the hair seller and tell him what had happened to her. The next day, two people went to the wig store very early and they told the whole story to the hair seller. But he was extremely annoyed. He thought that the couple was making up the story to return the hair to him. Realizing that it was not easy to give the wig back to the hair seller, Umi secretly pulled Hiro and told him to leave the store. Because of being failed in persuasion and getting told off by the seller, Hiro felt a little embarrassed in front of her. But Umi didn't care too much about it. What she focused on at that moment was just finding a way to get rid of the wig. Not knowing what to do, Umi was going to throw it in the trash. But Hiro was still wise enough to stop her. Umi's mood got worse and worse. She was so worried that she cried. Because surely if she kept it, she would see the scary woman again that night. Hiro thought it was better to keep it and find out if it was cut before or after the woman died. Because if it was true that this girl had her hair stolen by someone else after she died, she would probably be very resentful. If Umi threw out her hair, it would make things worse. Umi also felt that Hiro's words made sense, but she didn't know what to do. Hiro put his hand on his chin to think for a moment. Then he concluded that only the woman knew where the hair came from, so he had to find a way to meet her again to solve their problem. So Hiro offered to bring the hair home. He would be the one to try it on. That night, Hiro put on a wig to prepare himself to meet the scary woman. Not long after lying down on the chair, he fell asleep and he got into the dream. But it was a happy dream. Hiro found himself eating a lot of delicious food and even drooling on his pillow. The next morning he woke up. All of his plans failed. He couldn't see that woman. Umi also soon arrived at Hiro's house. She saw him sitting contemplatively on the chair and she approached. After learning the boyfriend couldn't see anything, Umi suggested that she bring back the wig and see how it goes. It was a bit scary. But this was probably the only way to find out the truth. Umi put on the wig and sat down on the sofa. Ten minutes passed and there was still nothing out of the ordinary. But then, Umi's face completely changed. Her eyes became lifeless and cold and her pupils also shrank to only the whites. The voice became deep and heavy. The sound came from Umi's mouth, but it was like coming from somewhere else. The woman entered Umi. She wanted them to give her hair back. Gathering the composure, Hira asked her why her hair had been sold like that. She didn't answer, just lowered her head. Seeing that, Hira also quickly persuaded her that for justice, he would return her hair. At that moment, she replied that her hair was stolen by two men. Hiro asked if there were any clues that could find the men. The woman could only remember that it was a crematorium, and from the window she could see the mountain on the edge of the city. Before asking anything more, he saw Umi foaming at the mouth and faint. Feeling that something was wrong, Hiro quickly removed the hair from Umi's head. He feared that if it continued, her body could not stand any longer. They went to several crematoriums in the city. Indeed, there was a place that had a direct view of the mountain. They also reported to the police about the stolen hair. According to the investigation, the crematorium was often complained by customers that they deliberately appropriated the property of the dead before cremation. In a short time, the police collected a lot of evidence about property appropriation so, two men working there were arrested. 
According to the testimony, they received the woman's body to be cremated. But because they thought that the hair was too beautiful and would make a lot of money thanks to selling it, they decided to cut it. Then they would sell it to people who made wigs, and Umi accidentally bought it. But if they cut it off, it would depreciate while the woman's hair was too perfect. So they chose to strip her scalp.